So we are going to talk about directional derivatives and a gradient vector. Now the idea of a directional derivative is that when we're looking at an xy plane and we have a function such as f of xy equals x squared plus y squared that takes in two variables and spits out an output, we want to think about the way that that function changes. And the first thing that we learn is to use partial derivatives. For example, the partial derivative with respect to x in this case gives us 2x and the partial with respect to y gives us 2y. When we do, for example, the partial derivative with respect to x, we say all variables that aren't x are a constant, and then we differentiate this function just like any other function. That essentially means that in our xy plane, we're looking at variables other than x, such as y, being a constant, and just looking at how the function changes as we move in the x direction. Similarly, the partial with respect to y talks about just changes when we move in the y direction. The question is, what if we wanted to move in the direction of some other unit vector, u, with coordinates x0 and y0? In that case, we're looking at what's called a directional derivative, a derivative in a particular direction in our xy plane. Now, in order to do that, we can denote the directional derivative as d with a little subscript of the unit vector of our function f, and we have to think about what this equals. Well, remember, any vector can be expressed in terms of x and y coordinates, and we know how to calculate changes in the x and y directions. Those values are going to come from the partial derivative with respect to x and the partial derivative with respect to y. In this case, our unit vector has an x length of x naught. So if we want to look at the change caused by that movement in the x direction, we'll take the partial derivative with respect to x and multiply it by how far we moved in the x direction. So we get x naught times the partial with respect to x. We can do a similar thing in the y direction with the y coordinate being y naught. So we have the partial with respect to y times how far we moved in that y direction. To get the total change of f, we take the x component and the y component and add them together. So this is one of the ways to express the directional derivative in the direction of this unit vector. There's one other way that we can express this, and that's by thinking about this addition here in terms of a dot product. What we can do is say that the addition of these two vectors is the same as taking the vector x naught y naught and dotting it with the vector of partial derivatives, f sub x, f sub y. In that case, we get x naught f sub x and y naught f sub y, we add those up. The vector on the right side here is called the gradient vector of f. And we denote it with an upside down triangle next to that function symbol. The gradient vector of f just means that we take each of those partial derivatives and put them in a vector. So one of the ways we can talk about the directional derivative in the direction of a particular unit vector is we say, take the gradient vector of f and dot it with the unit vector in the direction we're looking at. Now there are a couple other interesting observations that we can get from this expression of the directional derivative. First of all, let's remember that we can write the dot product in terms of another expression, the magnitude of our first vector, the gradient of f, times the magnitude of our second vector, well a unit vector has length 1, so we don't have to worry about that, times the cosine of the angle between these two vectors. In this case, one of the questions that we can ask is what direction should we move in our xy plane to get the fastest increase in our function with respect to how far we move? And in order to do that, we can look at the magnitude of this dot product, the directional derivative. The magnitude of the gradient vector at a particular point is always going to be constant because it's just those partial derivatives. But we can change the value of theta, which is the angle of our unit vector, with the gradient. In this case, if we want to maximize cosine of theta, that's going to happen when cosine theta equals 1, or in other words, when theta equals 0. That means that the direction that will give us the fastest increase in our function is going to be when the angle between our gradient vector and the unit vector is 0, or in other words, when those are parallel. So the fastest increasing direction is parallel to the gradient vector. 
And that fact has applications in places like neural networks when we look at the idea of gradient descent. Now there's one other important fact I want to take a look at with these directional derivatives, and that is, what direction should we move in to make the directional derivative equal to zero? In that case, remember, we can't control the gradient of f, but we can control this value of theta. So in this case, we need cosine of theta to equal zero in order for our directional derivative to be zero. That's going to happen when theta is equal to pi over two plus some multiple of pi. But essentially what that's saying is our directional derivative is zero any time the unit vector, the direction we're moving in, is exactly perpendicular to our gradient. So let's take a look at this function as an example. We can start by looking at the contour lines of this function. Contour lines are curves in the xy plane where this function always has a constant value. So if we're looking at x squared plus y squared equals some constant, that's going to be a circle, something like this. And if we move along any of these lines, that function is always going to have the same value. It's not going to change. On the other hand, if we look at our gradient vector, which in this case is going to be 2x, 2y, if we plot some of these vectors in our xy plane here, they're going to look something like this. And what you'll notice about these gradient vectors is any place where we look at the gradient vector and the contour line, those two are exactly perpendicular. And that comes from the fact that if we think about moving along a contour line, another way that we could think about that is taking the directional derivative of our function in the direction of that contour line. So if we think about the directional derivative in this direction, because it's a contour line, our function is going to stay the same, so the directional derivative has to be zero. And if the directional derivative is zero along a contour line, then that line must be perpendicular to the gradient in order to get that cosine theta in our dot product to make the whole thing cancel out. So the gradient vector is an idea that comes naturally when we start thinking about the idea of derivatives in the direction of a particular vector rather than just in the x and y axes. In that case, we end up with a dot product between that unit vector and the gradient vector. And because of that, when we look at the cosine of our angle, the direction of fastest increase of our function will be parallel to that gradient vector. And the direction where this derivative is equal to zero is going to be orthogonal to our gradient vector. So anytime we look at contour lines, the gradient vector is going to be perpendicular to those lines.